never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there was no building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. But if I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Mr. Delbert Rec Rector of Belmont, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Mr. Rector, can you begin with some background on yourself? To start with, where were you born? I was born in Cedar Springs, Michigan. Uh, and in what in year? 1918. 18. Uh. And uh, oh, when I was about seven years old, we moved to Comstock Park, and I went to school down there. And until uh, my parents got divorced, I went to live with my grandma and grandpa. And rector, where were they? Rector and okay. Grand Rapids. Okay. Now, what uh, did your parents do for a living? I mean, while you were with them? My dad was a professional painter, not. Uh, portraits, mm -hmm. but furniture and mm -hmm. cars and you name it, he could paint it. Okay. And was he able to keep working in the Depression years or? Oh, yes. He was still working when he died. Okay. Uh, and uh, my mother, of course, was a housekeeper. And, uh, yeah. and did you finish high school? Yes, I graduated from Union High School. And, and what year? 1938. Okay. And then after you graduated from high school, what did you do? I went to work for the Grand Rapids Cabinet Company, waiting to get into the drafting, into the engineering room. Mm -hmm. And I never made it, so I quit there. I went to work for Lear Incorporated. And uh, I was very fortunate that I got into the drafting room and done a lot of design work on aircraft accessories. Okay. Now, were you doing any of that before you went into the Army? This is before I went okay. into the Army. All right. right. Now, at a certain point, you decide to join the National Guard. Uh, well, I was uh, working at a gas station, the fellow that owned it, we drew straws to see who was going to volunteer to get in, get their year in in a hurry, and come back and run the station, and then the other fellow was going to go in for a year. I was very fortunate I lost. And uh, it took me five years to get my, almost five years to get my year in. All right. So basically, so did he go first, and then you, did he sign up first, and then you went in? Or? I went in and signed up to the National Guard. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next day, we were mobilized. Okay. So that's October of 1940. October 15th of 1940. Okay, right? so, so that's over a year before Pearl Harbor. Uh, did you understand why you were being mobilized? Well, we thought that we were going to go to Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't think anything about going to the South Pacific and fight the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Now, did you think that your year might be up before with the war with Europe in Europe started, or before we got there? Well, on December the 7th is when we declared war on Germany. Yeah, but that's 1941, so that's... 41, that's right. later. So... But you, uh, I didn't get out at the end of my year. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, now, after you're mobilized, uh, where did they send you? After I was mobilized, we went to uh, uh, Beauregard? Uh, Beauregard, Louisiana. All right. Uh, right. 
What was that camp like? You slept in a tent, and uh, fortunately we had a wooden floor, but no side walls, no screen doors, no, nothing like that. And what were you doing down there? Uh, just training. And uh, very fortunate, I was chosen to go to uh, a school right there at camp for uh, training. And then I got transferred to 3rd Battalion Headquarters Company. And what jobs did you have in the headquarters company? I was uh, in the S2 section. And later on, I became sergeant of the S2 section. OK. And what does the X S2 section do? Uh, basically, we went on patrols and intelligence uh, missions. And uh, well, when we got into combat, was on patrols all the time. Right. Okay. Uh, now, how how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to life in the army? The discipline and the physical training was that easy or hard? It wasn't that tough. No. Well, as long as we were in the states. Uh, in fact, we had it better there than I had when I was in civilian life. Why was that? Oh, because my folks were divorced and go from my father to my mother and back and forth. And I, I like to forget those days. Okay. But in the Army, you had the same group of guys that you were working with yeah, and living with. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, now, after a while at Camp Beauregard, they move you to a different camp? We moved up to uh, uh, Livingston, Louisiana. All right. Uh, now, how was that different from Beauregard? Well, we had, uh, we're still in tents, but you had a tent on a platform, and it had side walls up uh, all to your waist, screens above that, and a lot of fresh air coming in, screen door. So it was uh, very comfortable. All right. Well, were you? Is that where you were during the summer of '41? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Now it got hot though, didn't it? Oh yeah, but it uh, wasn't that miserable. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, did you go on any large maneuvers, big training oh, yes. exercises? We were on a, let's see, it was a summer of 1941. Mm -hmm. We were on a maneuver all the time. But I was very lucky. I was a battalion commander's chauffeur. And uh, I ride around in a, Oh, I can't think of the, uh, what they call those things. Did you have a jeep or a weapons carrier? A weapons uh, okay. carrier, right. Okay. So a little bigger than a jeep. Yeah. All right. So you got to just drive around. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, and, now, and the uh, major, he was from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they liked to booze it. <laughs> and, uh, now, when the division shipped overseas, did that major stay with you, or did they take some of the officers out? No, he, uh, <coughs> he didn't go overseas, no. Okay. Now, while you were down in Louisiana, they started to bring in draftees to oh, fill yes. out the companies and yeah. things. Now, even though you were someone who joined the guard right before they left, were you still one of the old guys? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. OK, because you've yeah, been there. I, I was treated like an old guy. 
right. Well, I was probably, well, I know I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, were a lot of the guys who came down with the guard, were they older than that? Oh, no. Okay, most of the guard most were Most of them were younger. Okay. And then the draftees were mostly all younger. Well, they drafted uh, fellows until they were 27 years okay. old. So even then they were taking a lot. Well, okay. Well. But you had a little more experience than they did. All right. All right. Uh, now, do you remember hearing about Pearl Harbor? Yes. How did you learn about that? It was on a Sunday afternoon, and I was playing setback. And over the radio, they said that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And we said, oh, no. And at that point, the captain got us all together. Well, we had a convoy that went down to New Orleans uh, just for a weekend. So they had to round all those guys up and bring them back. And we took all of our, uh, well, our packs and uh, guns and we went to Monroe, Monroe Louisiana. A uh, guarded ammonia plant there. Right, so you did go on kind of a high alert. or You didn't know what was oh, gonna happen. Yeah. We didn't know where we were going to end up. Now, did things quiet down a little bit? Oh, after that, yeah, yeah that uh, cooled down and went back to camp. All right. And then when was it that they moved you out from the camp? Uh, in December of 1941. Okay. Well, we weren't were you there a little bit longer than that? Because December 41 is Pearl Harbor. And De December the 7th. Yeah. But later that year, no, it was in January okay. of 1942, mm -hmm. we went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. So we thought we were going to be going to Europe. Right. And then what happened when you got to Massachusetts? Uh, I don't remember exactly how long we were there, mm -hmm. but uh, then we uh, they shipped us from there to San Francisco and then over to Australia. All right. Uh, do you remember anything about the trip to San Francisco? How yes. long it took her? We went by train and uh, when we got out to San Francisco, we went to the Cow Palace. And uh, it was a Cow Palace. <laughs> it was like a big arena where you could... Big arena with tours of seats up mm -hmm. there, uh, not, uh, cement uh, slabs. Mm -hmm. well, that's where we slept. And uh, went on marches around town. And, and we got on a boat and went to Australia. All right. Uh, before we continue, I want to go back a little bit to the time you spent in Louisiana. When you were down in Louisiana, did you get to go down to places like New Orleans? Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we we'd get a weekend pass and, uh, and we, well, I guess I went to New Orleans. I mean, twice, mm -hmm. or maybe three times. Okay. Now, would you drive the officer there or just go with the convoy? Oh, no. And, uh, if we got a pass to go down there, we'd get on a bus and go okay. down. And could you also go into Alexandria or the other towns around there? Alexandria, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was there to do in these places? What could you do if you went into town? Go to a bar and have a beer. Mm -hmm. All right, um, okay, now we'll go back to your story here. They've got you to San Francisco. They put you on a ship. Uh, what do you remember about the sea voyage? 
<coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, I don't know how long we were on the boat, but uh, we uh, were in the state rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, Twelve guys in a stateroom that was made for two people. Right. So this was a converted ocean liner? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I had bunk beds. And when you left port, uh, did a lot of guys get sick? Seasick? Seasick, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I never got seasick. Never. Now, did you have a trick for that? How did you avoid being seasick? I don't know. I just never got seasick. Okay. Uh, and do you remember crossing the equator? Uh, yes. Did they have a ceremony for that? Oh, yeah. They had a ceremony. Uh, I, what did they? I forget what they called us then. But, uh, I think you were a polywog until you cross, and then you're a shellback or something like that. Yeah. Right. Now, where did where did you where did they send you to? You leave we San Francisco. We went to South Australia at a little town called Sandy Creek, mm -hmm. and I camped there. That uh, later on uh, became a POW camp where they brought uh, Italians in there. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, what did you do when you got to Australia? Uh, just go on hikes around the count, around the country, and uh, a little training. Yeah. And then uh, you're there for a while. Uh, did they move you someplace else in Australia? Uh, yes. We went from Sandy Creek. We went up to Brisbane. Okay. And how did they get you there? By train. And what was that like? Uh, well, the train was open on the sides, had a running board on there. You step out when they stopped and just, uh, it looked like it was made in Probably 1890s. Very crude. It was it an old steam engine? Pardon? Uh, like a, a coal burning steam engine or something? Oh, yeah. 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 And with the open sides, I mean, would you get cinders open or something? Open sides, smoke? yeah. Yep. Okay. No windows. Uh... And then once you got up to Brisbane, what did you do there? Oh. Uh, set up camp and uh, uh, we were in a big barracks and, and we were there for a while and we'd go out on patrols, uh, on marches. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, did any of the Australian soldiers come and, and try to help train you or teach you about no. the Japanese? No. And was any of your training kind of geared toward what the Japanese would do? No. Okay. We, we had no idea what they were like. All right. Uh, and then after you, you finish up there, where do you go next? From Brisbane, mm -hmm. we went to, uh, well, went up to New Guinea. Okay. Up to Port Moresby. All right. And how did they get you there? Went by uh, LSTs. Okay, so you're on. Sh you were on ships then. You yeah. weren't flying in. Okay. Uh, do you remember anything about that trip? Sailing uh, on an LST. You were crowded in there like packed, and uh, or just slept right out on deck. Mm -hmm. Very crowded. Very glad to get to New Guinea. All right. Now, when you got there, um, what, what did Port Moresby look like? 
You land there. What did you see? I was they had one building there. That was it. That was our headquarters. Mm -hmm. But we were camped outside of uh, Port Moresby itself. Okay. And then what did you do once you got to New Guinea? We weren't there very long until we, they loaded us on trucks, took us part way around the southern part of uh, New Guinea. And then we got on an airplane and flew part way over the Owen Stanley Mountains and got out of the, out of the airplane. And uh, then we, uh, walked on a muddy trail up to Buna. Okay. Now, had you ever been on an airplane before that? Uh, yes, here in the States. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what do you remember about flying over the mountains? How long did it take or could you see anything? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> We had, I don't remember how many guys got into an airplane, but I can remember I was supposed to be on the airplane called the Flying Dutchman, but I, that was packed, so I had to catch the next one. And the Flying Dutchman crashed up in the mountains. And uh, we lost several men from our company on that. And so after that happened, were you a little bit worried about flying in the next one? We didn't know it crashed. Oh, okay. So, in fact, we didn't know anything about that for, I don't know, well, until we got landed and uh, the other airplane had well, as soon as they unloaded, they took off right away. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that they had crashed until oh, a couple of days later. Okay. Now, you land, and I think you landed at a place called Pangani, where they had built a landing strip. Uh, I don't remember the name okay. of the landing strip. All right. You land, but you still have a long way to go before you get to where the Japanese oh, yeah. are. Right. Uh, what was the, the, the country like? What was the terrain like that you were going through? Oh, mountainous, go up the hill, walk along the peak for a ways, go down the valley and up another mountain. All right. And, uh, uh, on a muddy trail. And, well, we had those, uh, not shoes, but uh, combat boots. Yeah, and they uh, got all muddy and rub your legs. And you got sores on your legs. Uh, then, and uh, see, did you have uh, natives helping you? Were there native porters carrying things, or were you carrying all your stuff? Oh, we carried everything. Okay. Uh, now, did, well, how much, how much, what, what were you carrying at that point? What did you have in your pack? Well, other than a day's ration, or maybe two days' rations, uh, had a shelter half and a blanket, and a change of clothes, and that's about it. Did you have a rifle? Oh, yeah. Because okay, so you have a weapon. I always carried your rifle. All right. Uh, now, were there men who would kind of throw stuff away as they were going? Because did things get too heavy? Right, throw our blankets out because you didn't need them. And uh, just keep your shelter half. And uh, that was about all you had in your pack other than your clothes. All right. And then I mean, as your clothes got all muddy, we take them off and put on the spare part and you had those on your back until you went to 
Well, I guess so we went back to Australia. Now, would the clothes kind of fall apart after a while? Oh, so no, they much. get holes in them. Mm -hmm. But we come to a river, you wash them off and put them back on. Mm -hmm. They dry on your back. All right. Uh, now, during this time, you're, you're marching, it was toward Buna, toward the area where the Japanese were defending. Yeah. Uh, did you see anything of the Japanese? Did the airplanes come over or? Oh, yeah, they'd come over and bomb, mm -hmm. you know. One time, that uh, was later on. Okay, but you were aware, what, you were starting to see signs of the fact that you were in a oh, war. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, when you got to Prangani and you were going toward Buna, uh, were you starting to see casualties coming the other way or? No. Not at that point? Okay. No. Now, what happened when you got up to the area around Buna? Oh, we set up camp there. Of course, I was in headquarters company, mm -hmm. so, but uh, the companies were put in different areas to uh, uh, drive the Japanese inland. Oh, that was, it was outside of Boone. It wasn't mm -hmm. right in the village. Right. And then what were you doing there specifically? Uh, going on patrols. I was in the S2 section mm -hmm. and, and going on a patrol about every day or every other day. Now, would you go during the day or at night? Uh, both. Okay. Uh, I hated night patrols. I didn't know where you were going. And uh, one time we were on a patrol and uh, the captain, well, he was a lieutenant then, but he says, we got to go this way. And I said, no, sir, that's the wrong way to go to get back to your headquarters company. You got to go this way. He insisted we go the other way, so we took off. And oh, getting towards evening, we, he realized that I was right and he was wrong, but he wouldn't say that. He says, how do we get back to camp? I said, we go this way. We're going that way, go this way. Now, when you're patrolling like that, did you have close calls with the Japanese? Uh, not very many. Once in a while, we'd run into uh, Japanese. But uh, one time, we uh, were on a patrol, and we got down to where, well, the trail was going through the jungle. There was a path going out, and we stopped there, and a Japanese officer stepped around from a big, very big tree and took a gun and held it up to Russ Gill's head and pulled the trigger. Fortunately, it didn't fire. And we we're hollering, Russ, get out of there, get out of there. Because Russ was between the officer and us, mm -hmm. so we couldn't fire because of Russ. So he finally got out of there, and we got the Jap officer. And I had the gun. Got back to camp, and back to headquarters, and I wonder why that gun wouldn't fire. And we had a little pit there where we throw garbage, mm -hmm. and uh, somebody had thrown a musket cover out there. I pointed the gun at that musket cover and pulled the trigger, and it fired. And uh, I, when we got back, uh, oh, later on, wife and I were camping up at Traverse City, 
and we uh, went up to see Russ Guild. He lived in uh, Central Lake, which is a little village just outside of Traverse City. And I says, you still feel lucky? And he says, I feel damn lucky. He's, he never did forget that. Right. Now, most of the time when you were on patrol, were you trying to find out where the Japanese were? Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. You wanted to see them, but you didn't want them to see you? Right. Okay. We had a few excursions where we had to fight our way out. Mm -hmm. But uh, normally we'd stay far enough away that uh, we could see them, but they couldn't see us. Okay. Uh, now, as the, you know, the, the fight at, at Buna took a while, and it got pretty costly, uh, one of the problems there was a lot of men were getting sick with malaria. Uh, now, did that happen to you? Oh, yeah. And how, how long was it before you started to get the fevers and... Oh, I don't remember it like. Okay. Maybe a month, two months. All right. But uh, like I say, if you had a temperature over 106, they sent you to the hospital. If it was under 106, you stayed with your outfit. All right. Now, what is it like trying to do your job when you've got a fever of 103 oh, or 4? It's just miserable. You're in misery all the time. And you get dysentery and yellow jaundice. And, uh, well, on my legs, they were in mud all the time. Mm -hmm. And the mud would rub on your skin and my, I'd break out. You go to the medics and they'd look at it and clean it off. And if it had maggots there, oh good, it'll heal up now. So they'd leave the maggots right there. And, uh, so, and then did they have anything that, that uh, could prevent the malaria? Uh, yes, we had, uh, uh, quinine, but when we ran out, they didn't have anything else. Yeah. And quinine just controls the symptoms. It, I mean, right. So you didn't have. So when you started, you didn't have adabrin. You didn't have anything to keep oh, it no, away. Oh no, adabrin. That came later on. So you really weren't prepared to be in the jungle. Pardon? So you really weren't prepared to be in the jungle. Was it what? You were not prepared to be in a oh, jungle. Oh no, no. no. We had no training in jungles at all. So, uh, what? Well, how did that affect the way you fought? You, you didn't know what the Japanese were going to do. No. Uh, so, how did you? Did you learn how to fight them? Oh yeah, we learned later on uh, some of their tricks, but. Uh, of course, I was in the headquarters company, so I wasn't right at the front all the time. Mm -hmm. I would go on patrols and get up to the front, but uh, I didn't stay there. Right. And you weren't sort of manning the, the, the front lines. So did you ever have Japanese try to get into where your command post was? Like or what did was? the Japanese try to come into the lines at night? Oh, yeah. Well. How close did they get to you? To me personally? Yeah. I was always back at headquarters. Okay. So ed headquarters was relatively safe? Oh, yes. Okay. Now, would they send bombers to attack you or aircraft? Oh, well. And they'd shell you with uh, artillery. Mm -hmm. But then one time, L Company radioed back that they wanted an uh, air-cooled machine gun brought up and ammunition for it. And the captain looked around the CP and there was another fellow myself there. He says, Rector, you take the machine gun and Vern, you take the uh, ammunition. And we had to crawl 
oh, maybe 100 yards through the kunai grass to where L Company was at. They were in this big round pit, maybe, oh, 15 feet in diameter that they had captured. And the bottom of that pit was uh, all Japanese that got killed. And I crawled, I, I think, probably 100 yards through the kunai grass and Vern done the same thing. But when he got to the, where the uh, pit was, he raised up to pass the ammunition in and got killed, probably 10 feet from me. And uh, I, I still get nightmares over that. Mm -hmm. You never get over it. Now, do you think that the scouting you did, did that, did that help your battalion move forward? Did you find ways where they could advance or holes in the Japanese line? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we'd run uh, flanking around the flanks and attack them from there. Because that's eventually how you beat them. You get you, well, you 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 win eventually because your guys get behind the Japanese. Yeah. They capture one place, then another, yeah. then another, uh, and it, it took uh, three or four months for all of that to happen. Oh yeah, to take the place. Now, did conditions at Buna get better? Did Didn't. the situation improve over time? Did you get more supplies or medicine or artillery? Or? Oh, we got supplies, but uh, when they, uh, a barge would come in and uh, unload supplies. But uh, when you're on the trail, they'd have airdrops. Mm -hmm. and, and did that work? Oh, well, yeah. So they didn't lose the stuff in the jungle or have it break when it landed? Oh, well, they, if they dropped a box, uh, it would break open, but uh, it still gets your rations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What, what were they feeding you when, when you're up at Buna? What were you eating? I mean, think you'd get three cans. One was pork and beans. Another one was uh, sausage links. Another one was bully beef. Another one was uh, little biscuits. And that's what we okay. ate. So you're getting sea rations pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Now, did, you, did they feed you Australian rations? Did you get mutton and that sort of thing? <laughs> Mutton. <laughs> to this day, I can't stand that stuff. Okay. Now, did you see much of the Australians when you were up at Buna? Because they were there too. Not a lot, no. Were they in a different part of the line? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what impression did you have of them? Either the people back in Australia or the soldiers up there? Well, the soldiers were very, very good and well trained. They, uh, they had a lot more training than we did. And uh, they, they were very good fighters. The civilians, oh, they, uh, well, Maybe two years ago, we took a trip back to Australia, and they were real happy to see us and invited us to our dinners. We had a, well, we, we went to a, LST, Ray 
Returned Servicemen's League mm -hmm. outing. And that, that was their uh, equivalent, our American Legion. Right. But they remembered who, who the Red Arrows were. They remembered the 32nd oh, Division. Yeah. 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 yeah, in fact, I met a guy over there that was, uh, got, he was at Buna when we uh, were up there. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, most of the guys who went to Buna did not stay with the unit for the whole campaign. They got sick or they got hurt. Uh, do you have a sense of maybe what proportion of your battalion was still there at the end? <clears throat> or how many casualties you had? Well, out of the whole battalion, it was probably less than 50. Mm -hmm. left. All right. And then once it was over, once you'd taken Boone up, what did they do with you? Where did your battalion go? We went back to uh, Australia and uh, on R&R and, &R and went to a little town called Coolangatta. And about how long did you stay there? Oh, I don't know exactly. It's probably in that. Uh, Ed was our uh, I'm the clerk, and he kept all the records. Right. Okay. So you get well. The, that that journal is, is sort of in, incomplete here. But basically, um, you're. I guess you leave in February. Of 43, maybe, and okay, yeah. Well, this is not a, a full accounting, but anyway. But you're there. But you're. Are you in there for several months, or back in oh, Australia? Oh no, no, like a couple of months. Okay. Now, during that time, did they bring in replacements and try to bring the division back up to strength? Did you get new guys? Mm -hmm. I don't think they brought in any replacements that I know of. Did they have guys who were recovering from illness and wounds? Oh, yes, but they were back with their outfits again. Right. So by the time your battalion moved out again, what strength do you think you'd gotten to? Oh, I think we were pretty close to full strength. Okay. So most of the men are, are coming back or being replaced somehow to do that. Right. Well, now, yeah, but... Uh, we had a few replacements, but I can't think of any. Okay. okay. Now, did you get sick with malaria yourself? Malaria? Yeah. I had a real high temperature <clears throat> and went to the hospital. Was there for a week, ten days. Now, was this a field hospital at, at Buna? Uh, or did they send you back from Buna? Oh no, you stayed right up there okay. at Buna at the 107th Medical Detachment. Okay. And, uh, now what could they do if you have the high fever? What could they do for you? Oh, well you'd get some quinine then from they had quinine, mm -hmm. or adiprene, I don't remember which. And that was, uh, and your fever would go down and mm -hmm. ship you back to your outfit. Right. Now, did the fever come back later? Oh, I had attacks after I mm -hmm. got back here. Mm -hmm. So that it never really goes away all the way. No. Okay. All right. Now, once the You've gone back to Australia, you kind of got the unit back together again. Uh, what did you do next? Once they move you out, where do they send you? We went up to uh, Milne Bay and went up the, uh, the northeast coast of New Guinea. 
Did you have to walk from Milne Bay, or did they put you in barges? Or? Oh, no, we, we walked, uh, oh, wait, no. We got on a uh, uh, LST mm -hmm. and would make a landing at different spots up the coast. Okay. Now, were some of these um, invasion landings or attacks against the Japanese, or were you just... Well, the Japanese were there, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'd drive them up into the hills. They'd go up in the hills and either starve or figure out how to get back. But they weren't fighting you too much when you landed? Oh, we'd, well, they had battleships sitting out there and they would uh, shell the coast and then we'd go in. And then when you landed, were they shooting back or did they get out oh, of the yeah. way? Oh, they, they were firing at you. Was the fighting at this point, was it easier? <coughs> Pardon? Was it easier than it was at, at Buna, or was the division in better condition to fight? It wasn't any different. Okay. So you were doing the same things you did before? You're still scouting and... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, we'd make a landing and I'd have to take a patrol and find out where the Japanese were and, or weren't. So. Now, did you have the same battalion commander the whole time or did those men come and go? No, we had a different uh, battalion commander. <coughs> Let's see. Do you remember who your commander at Buna was? Uh, I think it was Major Irwin. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you see much of them or just your company, CO? Pardon? Did you see much of the battalion commanders or just the company, CO? Oh, yeah. I see them almost every day because mm -hmm. I was at headquarters. The headquarters company, yeah. That's where they were at. Now, did that mean that you knew a little bit more about what was happening than some oh, of the other guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, was the attitude at headquarters different after Buna? Did they have more confidence, or was it always pretty much the same? Uh, probably the same. Okay. Now, there were times at Buna when the fight was not going very well. Uh, very... Very bad. Mm -hmm. now, did you ever hear from General MacArthur's headquarters? Would they contact the battalion or would they just contact the division? MacArthur. I, I never liked him. You couldn't trust him. They didn't know what was going on. And I'll tell you an incident when we were back in Australia on beach landing training. I was an observer and I had a telescope uh, setting up on this hill. Telescope in the coast and this barge come in and landed and MacArthur got off from it. And about three, four weeks later, I got a letter from home. My mother had sent me a picture of MacArthur landing, and this heading was, I have returned. And he returned to where? Mm -hmm. He was in Australia. He didn't return. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know, I just didn't trust him. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was, I mean, he, at some point, he actually relieved the division commander at, at Buna and kept ordering men to make attacks. 
when it didn't make any sense. Oh, he, he was a commander of the whole troops, right. all of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's not all that popular among no. men in the 32nd Division. No. Right? Yeah. Very unpopular. All right. Now, there was a point when the division was back in Australia, uh, when Eleanor Roosevelt came through and visited. Did you hear about that or see that? I remember that. Hot damn sun. You had to go out and stand in the sun and listen to her. So you didn't appreciate the attention? No. All right. Okay. So you make a series of landings on the north coast of New Guinea. Uh, the Sidor was the first one that the division made, and then there was Itapi and one or two others. And now you also landed on the island of Moritai? Uh, they landed on Moritai, right. Now, was that any different from the other landings? Um, no. About the same. Same kind of terrain and same situation? Yeah, mountainous, but uh, we weren't there very long before, uh, well, I never will forget, it was on a Thursday. I loaded the troops up, and they were going to ship them up to Luzon. And I was on rotation. And I got my orders to return to the United States. So I missed that by one day. And I never will forget that day. Because what happened to uh, the unit when it went up to Luzon? Oh, a lot of them got killed, mm -hmm. fighting up there. Okay. Now, how was it that you managed to go home early? You get so many uh, points for each month of service overseas. And I had enough points to come home twice. Mm -hmm. But you had to wait till your turn came. Uh, but because you had been with the guard already, you were in longer than the draftees, and because you mostly stayed healthy, you were also with the unit in the combat zone. Oh, well. So that probably helps the points accumulate faster? Well, you get, I forget the point system, but I know you get one point for each month overseas, two points for each time you were in battle, mm -hmm. in combat. Yeah. So that, that would have added up for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so once you get your orders, do they take you off the LST, or what happens to you? Well, I got on an airplane, mm -hmm. flew back down to Milne Bay, and then we got on a ship and came back to the States. All right. Now, what do you remember about that trip back? Uh, what kind of ship were you on? Uh, I wasn't on uh, uh, what I call a luxury liner. It wasn't. It was uh, huh. so just a troop ship. Yeah. Okay. Now, was that yeah. voyage? Um, was it easy or rough? Was the weather bad or? Oh, we had some bad weather, but if you're on the way home, you didn't care about the weather. Right. Okay. Now, in the different times when you're sailing around or going back and forth, uh, did you ever get attacked by Japanese aircraft or submarines or things like that? Uh, no submarines, no. But. One of the ships that was going from uh, Brisbane up to uh, Australia, up to New Guinea, mm -hmm. got torpedoed by, uh, with, uh, I don't know what company was on that one. Okay. Now, when you were in these different battles. I mean, did you get American airplanes helping you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Occasionally you'd get uh, bombers and 
Of uh, course, they had fighters all the time there. Mm -hmm. Now, at Buna, did you have air support? Were there bombers or fighters helping you even there, or not so mm -hmm. much? Occasionally, they'd come over. Well, they wouldn't bomb us because we were there. Right. But uh, I know one instance where they dropped a bomb on oh I, yeah on some troops uh, killed some of them, but that's all part of the war. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now you're, well, you kind of survived, you make it through, you're on your way back home. See, when did you get back to the States? Is that sort of end of 44 or? Mm. December of 44. Yeah. Probably so, about that time now. Do you remember Christmas that year? Were you on the ship, or had you landed, or you don't, I don't remember? I don't remember Christmas. Okay. Now, once you get back to the States, what did they do with you? Oh, uh, well, you got a, a month's delay en route, what they call a delay en route. So we came home. Mm -hmm. Then we went uh, back down Louisiana. And that's when I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Well, take it back, we went to Florida. Okay. And from Florida, we were assigned to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Now, were you going with a group of guys who had been in the 32nd, oh, or were no. you all scattered Just down? Individuals. Okay. Uh, and what did you do when you got to Fort Sill, Oklahoma? I was in charge of the communications section. I didn't know a damn thing about communications. But the captain says, you don't have to know anything. All these sergeants report to you. Because I was a tech sergeant, mm -hmm. all the other or buck sergeants, mm -hmm. and they just count them off. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Put them in charge of it. Mm -hmm. You get a Jeep and you ride around camp. Okay. And that's what I done. All right. Uh, All right. Uh, were they still training a lot of people there at that time? And Oh yeah, it was a field artillery. All right. <laughs> and, uh, the uh, PXs would get a shipment of stuff in there, so they go over and buy up all that you could get and take it back to the guys, and I'd give you the money for it. Now, at this point, did you really want to just go home? Yes. All right. Now, were you still there when the Japanese surrendered, or had they let you go home by then? Oh, I was uh, back home by then. Okay. Because that's when they dropped the uh, bombs on Hiroshima and mm -hmm. uh, the other one, I don't know. So you get home sort of in the summer of 45. Uh, once you got home, what did you do? Uh, on May the 12th, I got married. A 45 or 46? 45. All right. Were you still officially in the Army then? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because my wife's birthday as May the 13th. I got married the day before her birthday. Now, were you engaged at the time you went into the service? No. Okay. But I knew my wife, okay. though. 
but it wasn't like she was waiting for you for five years before you came back. No. Okay. All right. Uh, and then did you go back to the same kind of job you had before you left, or did you do something else? Oh, I, uh, I started uh, as a draftsman at Goldmeyer Livingston. I made a grinding machinery. And uh, I left there and went to Lear, worked on aircraft accessories. And I left there and went to Rapistan and uh, done design work. And then did you stay with them for a long time? I stayed with Rapistan until 1980, and then I retired. All right. Now, when you look back at the time you spent in the service, uh, how do you think that affected you or changed you? It made you appreciate life a lot better and the things that we had. Uh, you didn't need a heck of a lot to make you happy. And uh, wife and I has had, a, well, we've been married 67 years. So we've had a good life. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask a little bit different question here that kind of goes back into the uh, war part. Uh, did you ever see much of, of the Japanese, at least alive as opposed to dead, or were they mostly just in the jungle someplace? Not a lot, no. I, occasionally we'd get a prisoner. And Did you ever capture a prisoner when on patrol? or? Uh, I didn't personally, no. no. But there was a, I can still recall one prisoner. I don't know who, what company got him, but uh, brought him back to headquarters and after we got through interrogating him, a native policeman was going to take him back to the rear area. And he got down the trail maybe 300 yards. We heard of a gunshot went down there and the guy was dead. He says he tried to get away, but I don't think he tried to get away. Natives didn't like him any more than we did. Mm -hmm. Now, how did uh, the Americans get along with the natives? Very good. What kinds of things would they do for you? Oh, they'd carry our packs and uh, they enjoyed cranking a generator to send messages back. They, they thought that was a lot of fun. All right. What, Im what impression did you have of the Japanese? What did you think of them at the time? I don't know. I just... I guess I hated them because of what they'd done at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we were fighting them, and you couldn't like them. I guess you'd have to hate them. Now, did that carry over after the war, or did you just move on? Oh, for a while. Uh, well, when I worked at Lear, we had an office in uh, Japan, they sent a bunch of guys over here to see our headquarters and uh, see how, uh, how we went at designing stuff. And there was one guy that he asked me, was you ever in service? And I said, oh, I was in the Army where I was over in New Guinea. He said, I was there too. So, but uh, he was friendly. Mm -hmm. He was also lucky. Yeah. Most of them didn't come back. Right. All right. 
All right. Uh, when you think back about the time that you spent uh, in the service, and especially in Australia and New Guinea, uh, are there other events or things that happened that sort of stand out in your memory that you haven't mentioned here yet? Or just things about the people themselves or the places you were at? Pardon? Or just things about the people that you met or the places you were at? Oh. Of course, when you're up in New Guinea, uh, all soldiers, you, you didn't see a civilian. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we had one a chaplain, Father Jenis. I was from Detroit, very friendly. But uh, Australian people were very friendly. Uh, of course, they, the men didn't like us going to town and dancing with the girls. <laughs> did you have more money than they did? No, I don't think so. I don't know how much they had. Yeah. But you were competition. We, of course, when I was in Australia, I was a corporal, so you're getting, what, $60 a month? Of course, I'd send half of that home. All right. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to the story before we, we close it out here? Oh, nothing except uh, I was very, very happy to get home. All right. I just, uh, in fact, when we landed in San Francisco, we got off the boat, we got out on the dry land, you got down and kissed the good earth. <laughs> and I can still remember that. All right. All right. Well, that makes, I think, a pretty good closing. So I'd just like to thank you for coming in and talking to me. You're welcome. Today. All right. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building out of standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done.